Welcome back. We're going to be looking at this example today. We want to sketch the graph of the function f of x equals x to the fifth power minus 5x. And so in order to sketch the graph of a function, there's going to be a series of steps that we're going to want to go through. And so the first thing we want to do is to determine the domain of our function, right? What values of x is our function defined for so that we have a better idea of where we're going to be graphing it. And you'll notice that we have a nice little graph down here that we will be using to sketch the graph of this function. And we'll add things to that graph as we move along with each step. And so to find the domain, typically you would want to look at what is going to make your function not continuous, right? Where are you going to have a gap or a break in your function? And so luckily this time we have a function that is a polynomial. We just have these terms, x to the fifth power and our term negative five x here, which are going to be continuous for all values of x. There's no value of x that if we plugged it into this function, we'll get an undefined value. So we can say that the domain of this function is from negative infinity to infinity. It is defined for all values of x. It's continuous everywhere. And so that's actually the second thing that you want to do when you look at how to sketch a function is to determine its continuity. And that kind of goes hand in hand in with the domain. And so since we found that our function is defined for all values of x, then we can also determine that it is continuous everywhere. And so because of that, because we found that it is continuous everywhere and that our function is a polynomial, then we can also make the conclusion that this function is not going to have any asymptotes, right? Because that's the next thing that we would want to check when we're sketching the graph of a function is we want to locate any potential asymptotes, whether they be vertical asymptotes or horizontal asymptotes. But in this case, we have no asymptotes. All right, so now that we have determined the domain of our function, we have determined where it's continuous and our asymptotes, which we said there aren't any, we can now move on to actually finding some different points about our function that's going to help us figure out how to graph it. And so the first ones we're going to find are our x and y intercepts. And so we'll start by determining our x intercepts. And the way you do that is you set your function equal to zero and solve for x. And so if we do that in this case, we'll have zero is equal to x to the fifth power minus five x. And so then if we solve for x, I see we have a common factor of x in each term. And so I'll pull that out. So we'll have that zero is equal to x times x to the fourth power minus five. And then we can set each part here equal to zero. So we'll have that x equals zero and that x to the fourth power minus five equals zero. And so this one's already solved. We see that x is equal to zero. But for this one, we have to do a little bit more work yet. So we'll have x to the fourth power is equal to five if we add five to both sides. And then if we take the fourth root of both sides, we'll have that x is equal to plus or minus the fourth root of five. And if you were to plug the fourth root of five into your calculator, you would find that x would be approximately equal to plus or minus 1.495. And I'm gonna round that to just be 1.5. I hope you're okay with that. So we'll say that x is approximately plus or minus 1.5. And that's just going to help us plot our points a little bit easier. But what we found here is that we have three x intercepts, one at x equals zero, and then two at x equals plus or minus 1.5, approximately. And so our three x intercepts are zero, zero, 1.5, zero, and negative 1.5, zero. And so now let's go ahead and plot those on our graph. All right, so one of our x intercepts is at zero, zero, which is the origin. So I'll plot that point first. And then our other two are going to be at 1.5 and negative 1.5 approximately, but that's going to be good enough for this sketch. And so I'll plot the first one here at 1.5 and then I'll plot at negative 1.5. All right, and so now that we are done plotting our x-intercepts, we want to locate our y-intercepts. And we do that by plugging zero into our function. So we'll have that y is equal to zero to the fifth power minus five times zero, and that's going to be equal to zero. So we find that y is equal to zero in this case, which means that our only y-intercept is going to be at zero, zero. But if you notice, this is also one of our x-intercepts. And so we actually didn't learn anything new here. We didn't gain another point that we can plot on our graph. We already plotted the point zero, zero on our graph. So there's nothing more for us to do there. And so with that, we're done with all of the algebra aspects of sketching the graph of our function. And so now let's move on into our calculus concepts, such as taking the first derivative and the second derivative of our function and seeing what we can learn from those derivatives. All right, so I cleaned our work up a little bit because we're gonna move right along into our derivatives now. And so we're gonna start by taking the first derivative of our function and finding our relative extrema using that first derivative, and then we'll move into the second derivative. And so if we take the first derivative, we'll have f prime of x is equal to 
5 times x and then subtract 1 from your exponent. So I have 5x to the fourth power. And then the derivative of negative 5x will be negative 5. Because when you have a variable to the first power, the derivative is just going to be the coefficient. So negative 5. And so here's our first derivative. And so now what we want to do is we want to set that first derivative equal to zero and solve for x. And those are going to be our critical values where the slope is zero. And those are the points that have the potential to be relative extrema, whether that be a relative min or a relative max. And so if we set our derivative equal to zero, we'll have zero is equal to five x to the fourth power minus five. And if we solve for x by adding five to both sides, we'll have five is equal to five times x to the fourth power. And then if we divide both sides by five, we'll have that one is equal to x to the fourth power. And then we can take the fourth root of both sides and we'll find that x is going to be equal to plus or minus one. And so what we found here is that we have two critical values at x equals negative one and x equals positive one. And so now we want to determine if these are going to be a relative min or a relative max by using our first derivative test. And if you're not familiar with the first derivative test, I do have a lesson video on that topic that you can check out. I'll link it here for you. But if you do know how to do the first derivative test, let's move right along into it. So to perform our first derivative test, I like to draw a number line that's gonna help us stay organized. And I'm gonna label our two critical values on here. So we're gonna have negative one and positive one. And so now what we learn from this number line is that we have three intervals that we're going to test to see where our function is increasing or decreasing, which is going to help us determine whether we have a relative min or max at each of these critical values. So we have the interval from negative infinity to negative one, the interval from negative one to one, and the interval from one to infinity. And so I'll write those down. We have negative infinity to negative one, we have negative one to one, and then one to infinity. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pick values between our endpoints and plug them into our first derivative and see what that value is. And so for our first interval here, I'm gonna pick negative two. So we'll have f prime of negative two, and we're gonna plug that into our first derivative. Now I'm going to apologize in advance because what's going to happen here is for the sake of time, I'm not going to show explicitly the calculation of plugging all these values in. And so I'm just going to tell you what these values are, but I highly encourage that you pause the video whenever I plug a value in and see if you can get the same value that I'm going to get. But if you're having any issues and you find that you can't quite get the same value I'm getting, please leave a comment and I will try to help you out. But if you were to plug negative two into your first derivative, you would get positive 75. And that is a positive value for our first derivative, which means our function is increasing on that interval. And so I'm gonna label that on our number line here, that our function is increasing on that interval. And then for our second interval, I'm gonna pick zero as our point. That's going to be between negative one and one. And so if we plug zero into the first derivative, hopefully you see that that will be negative five because this will just be zero. And so we'll have negative five and that is a negative value for our first derivative. And so that means that our function is decreasing on that interval. And so I'll label that on our number line as well. And then for our third interval, I'm gonna plug in positive two. That's going to be between one and positive infinity. And if you plug that into your derivative, you will get positive 75 once again. And that is a positive value, which means that our function is increasing on that interval. And so I'll label that on our number line as well. And so now what we have found here is that around our critical values of negative one and positive one, our function is changing from increasing to decreasing and then it's changing from decreasing to increasing. And so since the sign of the slope is changing around these points, that means that these are both going to be relative extrema. Specifically, negative one is going to be a relative max because the first interval around it is positive, and one, positive one, is going to be a relative minimum because the first interval around that, our slope was negative. And so to get our full points, what we have to do is we have to plug negative one into our function to get that y component, and then plug positive one into our original function to get that y component. And so if we plug negative one into our function, we will get positive four. And so we have negative one, four as one of our points. That is our relative max. And then we'll plug one into our function to get one minus five. And so that will be negative four. So we'll have one, negative four as our relative min. And so what we're going to do now is plot these two points on our graph. And so I'm gonna start with the relative minimum and our relative minimum is at one negative four. And so we'll go to one and then negative four. And so I'll plot our point right there. And then our relative maximum is at negative one, positive four. So we'll go to negative one and then positive four. And so that's going to be where that point will be plotted. All right, so now that we have plotted our relative extrema, we are now done with the first derivative. 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to move on into the second derivative and look at any possible inflection points as well as the concavity of our function. And so I'm gonna remove the information that we no longer need and then we'll move on into the second derivative. All right, so I cleaned up our work a little bit. I kept our number line for the first derivative because we're gonna need that later. And then I also kept our two points here so that you can remember which one was your relative max and which one was your relative min. But now let's take the second derivative of our function here. And so if we do that, we're going to have that f double prime of x is equal to four times five, so that will be 20, and then subtract one from your exponent to get x to the third power. And then the derivative of negative five, which is a constant, is just going to be zero. And so this is our second derivative. We have f double prime of x is equal to 20x cubed. And so now what we wanna do is find our potential inflection points by setting that second derivative equal to zero. And remember that your inflection points are where the concavity of your function is changing. And so if we do that, we'll have zero is equal to 20x cubed. If we divide both sides by 20, we'll have x cubed equals zero. And then of course, the cubed root of zero is zero. So x is going to be equal to zero. And so what we learn here is that our function has the potential to change its concavity around this value of x equals zero. But to know for sure if it's an inflection point, we have to test the intervals around that point to see if our function is concave up or concave down. And so now we'll move into that test. And so I'll draw a number line for our second derivative here, and we will label our one potential inflection point of x equals zero. And so just to keep these two separated, I know I have them color coded, but I wanna make it a little bit easier. And so I'm gonna write that this is f prime of x and this is f double prime of x. Hopefully that allows you to more easily distinguish between these two number lines. All right, so now to test our concavity, we see we have two intervals here from negative infinity to zero and from zero to positive infinity that we need to test in this case. And so we have negative infinity to zero and then zero to positive infinity. And so I'm gonna pick values between the endpoints of our intervals and see what we get on our second derivative. So for the first interval, I'm gonna pick negative one. So we'll have f double prime of negative one. And if we plug negative one into our second derivative, we'll get negative 20. So this will be equal to negative 20. And so that is a negative value for our second derivative, which means that our function is concave down on that interval. And so we'll label that on our number line. And then for our second interval, I'm gonna plug in positive one. And if you plug positive one into your second derivative, you will get positive 20. And so that's a positive value for your second derivative. And so your function is concave up on that interval. So I'll put a plus sign on the number line for that interval. And so now we're done with testing the concavity and we can see that around the value of x equals zero, our function changes from being concave down to concave up. And so that makes this point at x equals zero an inflection point. And so if we plug zero back into our original function, we'll get zero back out. And so our inflection point here is going to be at zero, zero. That is our inflection point. However, that really doesn't tell us too much because we already plotted the point zero, zero on our graph. Because if you remember, zero, zero was also one of our x-intercepts and our y-intercept, and so we already graphed that. And so there's nothing new to add to our graph. But do keep in mind that at the origin, at zero, zero, our function is going to change its concavity. And so now we're ready to finally sketch the graph of our function here. We have all the information we need in order to sketch a pretty accurate drawing of our function. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna clean up my work a little bit, and then we're gonna go through one more thing that's really going to help us sketch the graph of our function. All right, so I cleaned up our work, and now what we're going to do is we're going to draw a number line that combines both of our previous number lines so that we can see the first and second derivative side by side for each interval of our function. And so let me show you what I mean. We're gonna have a number line here, and we're going to transfer over all of the different points that we labeled on our previous two number lines. So we have negative one, zero, and one. And so I'm gonna label those on this one. We'll have negative one, zero, and positive one. And so then on the top of our number line, we're gonna put all of our signs for the first derivative. And then on the bottom, we're gonna put all our signs for the second derivative. And so we see that from zero to negative one, our first derivative was positive. And so I'll put that there. And then we see that from negative one to one, our first derivative was negative. So that means for both of these intervals here, from negative one to zero and from zero to one, it's going to be negative because from negative one to one, right, it is negative. So it will be negative for these two intervals. And then of course it is positive for that last interval. And so then what we're gonna do is we're going to do the same thing for our second derivative. We see that from all the negative values up to zero, our second derivative was negative. And so that means for these two intervals, we can write a negative sign. 
and then from zero to positive infinity, we had a positive second derivative. And so we can put plus signs for those two integrals. Hopefully you were able to follow that. Because now what we can do is get rid of these two other number lines, and we can just use this one to sketch the graph of our function. And this is going to be particularly helpful if you watched our lesson for this topic, where I showed you a chart that gave you all the different shapes of curves based on the sign of your first and second derivative. And so I'll put that chart up here on the screen for you to see. And then if you wanna kind of pause the video and take a look at that and compare it to this chart, I think that's gonna be helpful in determining what the graph of our function is going to look like. And so let's finally sketch the graph of this function. All right, so to sketch the graph of our function here, we need to at least connect the points that we already have plotted here in a way that makes sense and matches up with what we found for the first and second derivatives. Now, if you see from our second derivative, we know that our function is going to be concave down up until the origin, but concave up after the origin or after x equals zero. And so we know we're gonna have a concave downward shape on this side and a concave upward shape on this side. And so hopefully it makes sense as I connect these points, our function should look a little bit like this if I were to connect all of our points. Not my best drawing, but it'll do. And if you look at our number line, everything should match up with this sketch right here. Our relative maximum is the highest point in its area. Our relative minimum is the lowest point in its area. Now I didn't really do a good job of making sure it looked like that, but you get the idea. I was trying to connect those points where this was the lowest point and this was the highest point. And then we went through our x-intercepts and you'll notice that the concavity changed at this point right here, right? We're concave down up until this point, And then from here on, we're concave up. And that should make sense because we found that the origin was our point of inflection. And so then everything for our first derivative should match up as well. We already checked the concavity, but if you notice here, our function is increasing up until negative one, which lines up with what's on our number line. And then it's decreasing up until positive one, which also matches up with our number line. And then it is increasing after positive one. And so everything matches up here. Our concavity is good and our first derivative is good in terms of increasing and decreasing. And so this is going to be a fairly accurate sketch of our function x to the fifth power minus 5x. And so hopefully you were able to follow this example. These are long problems. Curve sketching takes a long time because there's a lot of different steps. There's a lot of different things involved to make sure that you are collecting the correct information and then using it correctly. And so if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I have for now. So I will see you next time.